Okay, thanks everyone for attending today's Pangeo Showcase. Uh, our speaker today really doesn't need any introduction at all, but just for consistency, uh, I'm really excited that we have Ryan Abernathy here today. Ryan is a CEO and co-founder of Earthmover, as well as a former research professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. Uh, Ryan is also one of the founders of the Pangeo Project and has done a really tremendous amount of work bringing it to be the community it is today. Um, he's also a core developer of many of the tools in the Pangeo ecosystem, including X-Ray and Czar, uh, and has created this really cool open source project called Ice Drunk. So thank you, Ryan, for being here today. Please take it away. Uh, thanks, Max. It's really awesome to be here sharing this work um, with the Pangeo community. Um, all of the problems that Ice Chunk is designed to solve, we learned about from interacting with people like you, folks who are using you know, data in the cloud in really innovative and ambitious ways. And so um, I think you know, everyone here can sort of feel like they played a part in this and uh, we'd love to involve you all in Ice Chunk going forward. Um, just a quick word about uh, our startup Earthmover. Um, this is what I've been doing for the past two years. Uh, Earthmover is a public benefit corporation, and our mission is to empower people to use scientific data to solve humanity's greatest challenges. Uh, it was founded by myself and Joe. Um, and we're just super excited to have this as a tool to push forward um, sort of the state of the art with uh, scientific data technology, um, which is an area that we feel like needs a lot more focus and investment and and uh, and has a tremendous potential, you know, to do wonderful things for our in, entire planet. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons we wanted to start a startup is to do more ambitious, bigger things than what we felt like we could do in our previous jobs and really go all in and, and take some big swings at some really hard problems. Uh, and I feel like Ice Chunk is a great example of one of those things that would have been hard to imagine shipping uh, without this as a vehicle. Um, so uh, let me dive into it. Um, I gave a 55 minute version of this talk uh, yesterday on a webinar uh, that we did at, with Earthmover. And um, I am going to strive to give a 20 minute talk today. And that means cutting out some stuff. And fortunately, I think folks have a lot of context on this problem. So I'm going to skip my very long introduction to this problem and so kind of cut to the chase um, a little quicker. And I'm going to focus really on what is Ice Chunk actually do? How can you use Ice Chunk today? What is it for? And I'm also going to skip the sort of deep dive into the technology, how it works. I know that's of, of interest. Um, I think we have some good documentation on that, um, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions there, but I'll, I'll kind of skip over that. And I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, you know, why we decided to open source this and uh, how it fits into our overall uh, roadmap at the company. Um, so Ice Chunk was created against the backdrop of the status quo that I think we are all familiar with. And in fact, we have all helped create. Many of the core problems around working with scientific data in the cloud have been tackled directly by this community, by Pingeo. And it kind of starts from the fact that most of the archival array storage file formats, such as HDF5, NetCDF, and GRIB, are not really designed to work well with cloud object storage, and so they are slow and inconvenient to work with. Nevertheless, there are literally exabytes of data being produced in those formats uh, from our uh, both public sector and private sector data providers. We as a community have really championed Czar as a great uh, way to work with cloud with array data in the cloud in a sort of more cloud native way. And um, I'm really proud of how far we've pushed that. Um, it's certainly catching on. Uh, it's catching on, I think, much more quickly in the private sector than it is in 
the public sector and um, in academia. Um, that's been my observation. Um, but there are some limitations around how we're using Czar today. Um, first of all, there's just the problem that data don't ever originate in Czar for the most part. They always have to be transformed into that format, which just creates a sort of cost. Um, as I'm going to detail a little bit more in my demo, Czar, because it's a file format that spans uh, multiple files, actually, it's not a file format. It's more like a directory format. It has some consistency problems that make it unsafe to use in a sort of multiplayer context where there's multiple users trying to read and write from the same data at the same time. And this can make it also hard to detect and fix corrupted data that occur as a result of, you know, failures of processing pipelines and jobs and stuff like that. There's a tremendous amount of excitement and enthusiasm around the Kerchunk slash virtualizar approach to sort of retroactively optimize existing uh, archives of NetCDF or, or GRIB files. Um, but I think it's safe to say that no major agency has really put that into production a, as an approach yet. And there's still a lot of questions about how to sort of operationalize it and deal with the sort of flood of uh, you know, information that comes out of that process. So this is kind of my assessment about where we stand. And within this landscape, we are, are introducing Ice Chunk as a kind of solution to many of the above problems. Uh, so Ice Chunk is an open source cloud native transactional tensor storage engine. And I'm gonna un unpack what I mean by that, which is I realize quite a mouthful of technical words. Um, so uh, here's a sort of basic introduction to Ice Chunk, what it is. Uh, it is a transactional cloud native storage engine for Czar. So Ice Chunk is not a standalone library currently in its current form. Uh, you have to use it together with Czar Python specifically Zara Python 3, to do anything useful. Through that, it is compatible with both X-Array and Virtualizar, um, X-Array for opening, querying, and writing data, and virtual, uh, Virtualizar for creating these reference or virtual data sets. Uh, the core of Ice Chunk is implemented in Rust. This is something new that we have uh, gotten into. And the Python part is just kind of a thin wrapper on top. And Ice Chunk is 100% open source, uh, Apache 2.0 license. Um, and so uh, if you want to go check out Ice Chunk on the web or on GitHub, here are some links you can follow. Everyone go give Ice Chunk a star on GitHub. Um, okay, uh, so what do I mean by uh, storage engine for Zar? So the data you can store in Ice Chunk are exactly the sort of same type of data you can store in Zar. And the data you can store in Zar, in turn, are basically the exact same data model that you can store in an HDF5 file. I really see HDF as having created and defined this data model. And it's pretty general. Um, at the top level, we've got a repo, which you can think of as a Zar store. And within that hierarchy, you can have groups and arrays. And they can be that can be as shallow or as deep as you want. You can actually have a repo just be even one array, and that's it. Um, all of these entities, both groups and arrays, can have metadata. And the arrays themselves are split into chunks, which are sort of the individual unit of storage and, and I.O. Um, so uh, we're all, I think, pretty familiar with this data model, if you're using Czar or, or uh, HDF today. Um, NetCDF conventions and stuff would sit on top of this. Uh, you don't have to use NetCDF conventions with Czar or Ice Chunk, but you can. Um, and so the main thing that Ice Chunk brings on top of this, it sort of adds this dimension of how does this data set get evolved and updated over time, right? So all rights to Ice Chunk occur within the context of what we call a transaction. So a series of interrelated updates. And then those generate a snapshot. And you only ever read and write from the store, or sorry, you only ever read from the store at one of those snapshots. And so this immediately solves this 
core problem that we encounter in czar of what if I want to read from the czar while somebody else is writing to the czar, what am I going to see? The, the way this works from a software point of view is uh, that uh, first to explain that, let's think about how we use czar today with cloud storage, right? So the, the standard way people use czar today with cloud storage is you've got your czar library and there's another library that's, sitting underneath czar it's an fs spec library either s3fs or gcsfs and that library is the thing that actually talks to the object storage czar just speaks in terms of keys and values right so czar sets various metadata keys and various data keys corresponding to chunks and with the standard usage those are just given to fs spec and fs spec translates them directly into paths in object storage or file storage, sort of one-to-one -one mapping between the czar keys and the things that are actually in storage. With ice chunk, we're replacing FS spec with ice chunk. We're keeping czar the same. And ice chunk is doing a lot more work in between. It's doing more complex mediation between what's in storage and what is exposed to czar. And in particular, it's responsible for writing the data in a way that enables these snapshots to be created and then retrieving data in a way that is aware of the current context of which snapshot and which version of the data set you're looking at. And so we chose this architecture, one, because we already kind of implemented something like this once the first time around when we built our, our ArrayLake platform. And so we knew it would work. And... Two, it just, you know, essentially hides a lot of the complexity from czar and allows this to be solved purely at the sort of IO level. Um, and on the, uh, along the way, we, of course, re-implemented the whole cloud IO layer in Rust. And as we'll see, that brings some additional benefits in terms of performance that are, um, uh, that are a nice sort of free bonus we get from using IceChip. So let me jump right to like, what does Ice Chunk enable? What does it let us do? Um, the first, and I, I feel most important uh, advantage of Ice Chunk is that it enables what we call multiplayer mode for Zar. This system of uh, transactions and snapshots enables much safer collaboration around shared Zar data sets in the cloud. What we have seen from folks is that uh, teams that are using czar in production do so very carefully because they're aware that um, once you've created a czar data set, if you have other data that's relying on it, you probably don't want to update it again. So even though it's this extensible cloud native format, we find folks using it more like a static format uh, and, and less like a database that can be updated uh, continuously. And so by Having all updates occur within a transaction and providing what we call serializable isolation between those transactions, we can ensure that readers will only ever see one of these committed snapshots. At the same time, we don't require any locking to take place. And these features make Zar overall work a little bit more like a database, um, which then enables a lot more safety and robustness around anything that depends on that data. So I'm gonna um, now switch to a um, a little notebook where I'm going to um, share a little uh, demo of this. So let me uh, share that, um, find that, let's see. Okay, there we go. This is the, hang on, are you still, what are people seeing here? You still see my slides? See demo on multiplayer mode. Okay, great. Ah, okay, you see the slides. Okay, shoot. Stop that share. Try one more time. Okay, so here I'm going to give, I think this is the only live demo I'll give just for the sake of time, but I think it's a, a, a cool one. And so here I'm going to prototype, I'm going to show two different Jupyter notebooks running side by side, both looking to looking at and talking to the same czar data set in cloud storage. I'm not going to live code, but I am going to live execute these notebooks. So we'll start over here on the left with what I call player A. I'll just import some packages. 
And then I am going to create an ice chunk store. And so I specify the bucket I want it to go into and a prefix within that bucket where I want to store it. And then I'm going to create a czar array and write some data to that array. Um, here, I'm just reading back some data. So this is a 10 million element array with chunks of 1 million. And I'll make a commit. So now just created a nice chunk store and I made a commit to it. Now I'm going to go over to um, player B and open that existing store and read back some data. And I see I get the, the value out. And I, um, uh, if I look at the commit history, I can see uh, that um, you know, it's, it's consistent with the commit that I had just created. So these are sort of unique identifiers for this, the snapshot that I've, I've created. Okay, now I'm gonna deliberately create a conflict between these two different writers. And this is demonstrating the sort of um, safety features that Ice Chunk brings. So I'm over here, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna set a value here. I'm gonna set this one particular element of the array to the value minus 999. And then I'm going to commit that. And so I've created another snapshot by calling commit. This is sort of how the flow works with Ice Chunk. You just manipulate your czar arrays, do whatever you want. And at the end of the, those changes, you call commit, and that creates a new snapshot. Now I'll go back to my other notebook, and I'll try to do change the same value. Now, in normal czar, this would just let you uh, overwrite that value, and you would never even know that these two processes potentially tried to modify the data uh, at the same time, you wouldn't know really who wins. Um, it would be hard to reason about the state of the store in this sort of contentious situation. Here, instead, we can see Ice Chunk is going to reject this update. It says, nope, we're not allowed to make an update because you're not on the latest branch of this uh, latest snapshot of this data set. Someone has made an update to it. Now, if we'd like to retry that operation, we can reset our current state. We can check it out again. Uh, and then we can write uh, our value and then it will succeed. But we have to do it in, in the right, right order. And so all of these different users of the data will agree on the order in which updates happen. This is called, this is the database concept of serializable isolation. Um, now what I'm gonna do over in A is extend this array and I'm gonna do an update to this array. So I'm say I'm writing some data. Let's pretend this is a lot of data. And I'm writing terabytes of data in my update. And this is running, this is in progress. Now, a really important principle of Ice Chunk is until I actually call commit, no one else can see any of those changes. And all that's available to other readers is the previous snapshot. So here I'll go back to B, I'll check out the latest branch and I'll look at how big the array is. And I'll see it's still only 20, 10 million elements, not 20 million, and I'll look at the last value. And it's going to be 9,999, 9, 999, blah, blah, blah. And so I haven't seen those changes yet. Finally, I'm going to go back over to A, say my, my ingestion job finished running. I'm going to commit that and go back over to B, check out. And now finally, I see those changes. I see the full array size. I can get the data from the latest update. So I never see the data in its intermediate state while it's being written. And I can see the full history of these updates through my snapshot history. I can see all the snapshot IDs, the timestamp associated with them, and what the commit message is. So this maybe feels a little bit like uh, a Git uh, repository. Um, it, there's some parallels here with commits and snapshots, et cetera. Um, so that's my little demo. No fancy plot, no big dask dashboard crunching data but really uh, hopefully showing a core consistency property of this format that we think is just absolutely transformative for our ability to safely and scalably work with Czar in the cloud. Um, and so I'm just gonna clean this up by um, deleting the data. And this is gonna be our uh, one look into how Ice Chunk actually stores data. I'm gonna mostly skip the part about how Ice Chunk works under the hood, but as you can see, this is if you're familiar with the internal contents of a Zar data set, this does not look like one of those, right? Um, instead, what we've got are a bunch of chunks that are uh, uh, that are stored under random unique IDs. Um, and so every piece of data in Ice Chunk gets stored under a random unique ID. And then we have various metadata files like these snapshot files and chunk manifest files, which explain how those chunks are related 
And then finally, we have what, he, what we call our refs, branches that point to what is the latest snapshot for a particular branch. And, and, and that's how we actually find the, the entry point to the, the Ice Chunk store. So there's a lot more to this. You can go read about it on the Ice Chunk website. Um, but I will, um, uh, I will just leave the demo there for the sake of time. Um, I'm now going to go back to my slides and um, finish up my presentation. So, so um, what you just saw is uh, the process of creating a sequential history of snapshots in a ZAR dataset. Um, and this is just a visualization of what this looks like. And uh, Im immediately, this might trigger some familiarity. Some I've already mentioned Git before. And there are some parallels with how you would think about evolving a Git repository. And so another thing you can use IceChunk for is data version control. Right. So whenever we enter into an IceChunk store, we are on a branch. And just like in Git, the default branch is the main branch. And so we've got a little pointer to whatever is the latest snapshot for that branch. And that snapshot stores a link to its parent. And that stores a link to its parent. And through that, we can reconstruct our whole history. There's also a couple more things IceChunk can do. We can create a tag, which is an immutable pointer to any one of those snapshots. So a branch can move but a tag can't. Once we create a tag, it's always going to be pointing at the same data. This is really useful for any application that requires sort of exact reproducibility. Tag is perfect if you want to publish a, a data set while continuing to evolve new versions of the data on top of it. You would just create a tag, share a link to that tag, and then anyone who ever accesses that data set will always see exactly the same data. Um, until, of course, if you would delete the uh, entire store. But um, so this is uh, really important for that type of application. Other thing you can do is is branching. So you can, um, you know, uh, d go ahead of main. You can create a new branch and apply changes on it that are only visible on that branch. This is great if you want to have one data set where you're using some you know, version in production, and you want to prototype some changes, updates to that data set, test them out in your dev environment. You don't have to copy your whole czar data store to a new location, duplicating all of the terabytes. Instead, you can just use a branch for that. And then when you're ready to bring those uh, changes into your sort of production environment, you can just move the branch pointer uh, up. So the sort of same dev staging prod style workflow we're used to with code can now be used with data. Um, I think this stuff is super powerful, and we've really just scratched the the, the tip of the tip of the iceberg um, uh, with in terms of the tip of the ice chunk. Right? I, I saw the pun coming like a little too late. Um, uh, we, we would love if folks here would go explore this. I think this has huge potential um, in all aspects of open science and reproducibility. Um, you know, this data version control capabilities. I mean, we've all embraced this for code. Now let's do this type of thing for data. Um, so I, I'm going to skip the demo. It's really simple. You just create tags, you create branches, you know, um, you, you get the idea. Um, final thing I want to talk about, or second to last thing I want to talk about is virtual data sets, right? So virtual data sets are something that's, uh, I know, of great interest to this community. And I'm assuming a certain level of familiarity at this point with virtual data sets. But basically, the idea is that HDF5 files, NetCDF files, even TIFF files, inside them are just a bunch of binary, compressed binary blobs of smaller pieces of arrays that, at the end of the day, turn out to be compatible with the ZAR data model. And so if you know what compression codec was used and you know where in those files those uh, pieces of data are located, you can actually query them with the ZAR data model without having to rewrite the data into a new format. And that's super powerful. Um, I think this is something that our community invented. Uh, I want to shout, shout out Martin Durant as the creator of Kachunk, and then um, Tom uh, Nicholas for recently developing Virtualized R, which offers a sort of new way to manipulate these references. So it's a really great innovation. Um, in IceChunk, all chunks are references. This is a really good way to think about 
uh, how a chunk works. There's no idea, there's no sense of an implicit chunk that just is some file name. Every chunk is tracked. We know what file it lives in and we know uh, its size and its offset within that file. So that makes it really easy to add support for references to external files in nice chunk. Um, the ability to efficiently store and parse these so-called chunk manifests, these sort of tables of those chunks is really core to the ice chunk format. And so um, supporting virtual uh, data sets is relatively, was relatively straightforward to build. Um, we have implemented an integration with virtuality czar. Um, I, I, I think it was actually just merged and released. Um, so uh, this actually fully works right now. Um, when you, uh, so that's a way you can create uh, virtual data sets in, um, uh, in using ice chunk. Um, and then when you read them back, um, it's indistinguishable from native data sets. You don't need any special um, parameters or configuration. They just look like normal ice chunk stores. Um, and then what's even cooler is those virtual data sets can then incrementally be updated or overwritten with what we call native chunks. Um, so you could change uh, the metadata, you could update some coordinates, you could overwrite certain portions of the array and those would sort of incrementally layer on top of the archival data um, through new snapshots. And I think that's an interesting uh, uh, possibility that opens up some interesting possibilities as well. Again, I'm not gonna give the uh, full demo on the Ice Chunk website that you can go read about how it works and give it a try. Um, so yeah, skipping that demo. Okay, final impact uh, slide is performance. Um, this is something that we didn't necessarily design for at from at this stage of the project. We've been mostly focused on correctness and just having it work. And so it was really cool to just run some benchmarks and see some really exciting results. Um, so as we all know, just reading NetCDF and HDF data directly from object storage using H5Pi can be very slow and deliver poor throughput. There's been some good work on how we might improve that path. And um, I know the people here have worked on various strategies for optimizing those files, but out of the box, um, this is what you tend to get. This, this graph here is showing read throughput from S3. Um, so this measures how many gigabits per second we can pull from object storage. Um, and here uh, we are looking at, um, you know, for that path, it's uh, measured in megabits per second, maybe 100, 200 megabits per second. So really short of the potential, this compute instance has a network connection of 10 gigabits per second. So that's the hypothetical ceiling on how fast I should be able to get data um, from S3 into, the, into my instance. Now, just adopting Czar already gives a nearly 10x speed up on top of that. And so that's the same benefit we would expect uh, if we move to using per chunk rather than um, H5 NetCDF. Um, Czar Python 2 doesn't implement any uh, of its own concurrency. It can get some concurrency from FS Specs async layer, but folks seem to know if you really wanna get good performance, you gotta bring Dask into the mix with Czar Python 2. Um, and so when you bring in Z Dask, you get another uh, two, two or three X boost in terms of your performance. Um, I haven't talked very much about Czar itself, but I really want to shout out all the work that's happened in Czar over the past six months. As you may know, Czar is on the brink of another major release that's been driven by Joe. Um, and Czar Python 3, um, distinct from the Czar format version 3, um, uh, implements uh, a whole new pipeline for loading data and decompressing data that leverages async concurrency and multi-threaded decompression throughout. And so what that means is using Czar out of the box now no longer requires Dask to get that same level of performance. Just purely using Czar will deliver your, your um, you know, good IO performance. And that's, that's nice if your goal is to just keep your stack as simple as possible and you, you, do, you don't necessarily care about Dask's other features. Um, and so at that point, bringing in Dask doesn't really do much. Now, the really exciting line, of course, is this one, bringing in Ice Chunk um, with Czar uh, Python 3 um, instead of S3FS um, gives us a um, uh, almost uh, over 2x boost again in performance, bringing this up to seven gigabits per second. Um, 
again, we didn't do a lot of design for this and a lot of um, uh, optimization here. Um, we attribute this mostly to the fact that the IO stack is really in Rust now, and um, it's it's faster and more efficient at uh, sending all these requests to the object store. Um, and so uh, I think there's a lot more we could do to explore this. Um, these results seem robust. Um, there's clearly many dimensions to performance that are not measured or captured by this benchmark, but um, I'm excited about it. Um, okay, uh, so that was the last demo. I'm not actually gonna show it live. I'm gonna wrap up just by talking a little bit about um, how Ice Chunk fits into our roadmap at Earthmover. Um, so those of you who follow this may know of this more than two-year-old GitHub issue where I suggested we might be able to build something like this uh, imitating how Apache Iceberg works. And in fact, the name Ice Chunk is a sort of riff on Apache Iceberg, which is a really uh, popular um, cloud uh, uh, open table format that offers similar capabilities to what I described in Ice Chunk, except for tabular data. Um, and so uh, two years later, I closed this issue and linked to Ice Chunk and said, yes, we, we finally built it. Um, in between though, we took a long detour, essentially building uh, a platform that does many of these things as part of our platform at Earthmover uh, called Array Lake. Uh, and we built Array Lake in a different way. Um, uh, by leveraging both object storage and our own, what we call Metastore. So we built a system that stores chunk data in object storage while storing metadata, including this sort of metadata about chunk manifests and versions and all of this stuff in the Metastore. And so building this and getting it in production with real customers over the past year, we really learned a ton about this problem and some of the different sort of dead ends in terms of design uh, that exist within this space. And so with that experience under our belt, um, we were able to look at this and say, you know what, I think we can make this work without having to go to the Metastore at all. And we can offer um, these transactional and data versioning features purely by leveraging object storage. And so um, we uh, decided to do that and essentially open source this part of our platform. Um, at the same time, you know, we're evolving what our platform is and what it can do. So the first version of our platform um, was really focused um, heavily on these sort of data governance features, transactional safety, ver data versioning, uh, virtual files, and then a whole data catalog around uh, that data. And so that's what ArrayLake sort of V1 is. As we're open sourcing these capabilities, we're also moving on to uh, provide more value in the platform layer. And so this comes in essentially two uh, places, one on getting data into ArrayLake, um, that's through the ingestion engine. Um, ArrayLake itself is now gonna be using IceChunk as its core on this data format. So all the data stored by the platform will use this as the core storage technology. And then on top of that, we're building a, a layer we call the query engine, probably needs a little bit better name, uh, but for now that's the, the name we use. And this is a layer that essentially exposes data that you have stored in your data lake through a range of standards and standard protocols, uh, starting with OGC EDR for point queries, OpenDAP for just general interoperability and WMS for integrating data with web mapping services. And so this is kind of where we're going and how IceChunk fits into that roadmap. And uh, we're really hoping that uh, by adopting this open storage format at our core, um, this uh, offering is gonna become a lot more attractive to uh, more people. And so if you're one of those people who is intrigued by this, I would love to talk to you about what we're doing. Um, our, our vision at Earthmover is to really enable what we see as a planetary scale data federation in the cloud. We think cloud style computing has enormous potential to accelerate uh, reproducible open science and climate change solutions. And that's going to require really efficient exchange of data between all different types of organizations from academia to government to private sector. And so that's the focus of the technology that we are building at the company. Um, okay, that is my presentation. I didn't manage to keep it to 20 minutes, but I also did not consume the whole hour. So I will stop there and thanks for the patience.